everyone, this is Sophia Smallstorm, and I'm podcasting again today, and I invited uh, someone you might not know about. He does have his own activism in um, his region of the world, but I've known him for many, many years, and I've always been struck by how upbeat he is. He is one of these people who started in this alternative thinking conspiracy movement when he was quite young and it hasn't soured him yet and I'm always amazed when we talk um, by his his profound not only um, personal power and it's not it's not um, egotistical it's it's very philosophical. It's amazing to me. So I wanted to do a show with him because we always say such interesting things when we're talking and then I regret that they're not recorded and other people can't hear them. So today I'm bringing you Paul Stein from Victoria. Is it Victoria Island? No, it's uh, Vancouver Island. It's uh, Oh, sorry, uh, sorry. Vancouver Island. Oops. It's, it's the city of Victoria. Yes. Okay. So, Paul, hello. Hello, Sophia. Thanks for having me on your show. It's a privilege talking to you once again. And uh, I listen to a lot of your podcasts and love the work you do. And it's a pleasure being on your show. Well, Paul, you edit my podcasts. You put the bumper music in and you've talked me through um, some recording issues and all of that kind of thing. So I appreciate your presence in my life and unfortunately we don't talk enough we don't chat enough because you're very very busy and I know you have your activism your group up there in Vancouver yes in Victoria see now I don't even know what to call it (laughs) Vancouver Island it's Victoria the city it's a small it's a Victoria is the capital city of of BC Uh, it's on an island um, called Vancouver Island um, and it's it's a it's a beautiful island. It's it's just north of Seattle. It's actually below the 49th parallel. So technically, we should be part of the United States of America, but we're not. Um, but here in this small little town, I call it Gilligan's Island because it kind of reminds me of it um, in the aspect that it's we're we're separate from the mainland. So we've got a really tight local community here, especially in Victoria. And there's a lot of activism that goes on here. Um, it's a government city, therefore there's uh, a lot of people that, you know, they believe in the state, they believe in the government, they believe in they're dependent on the government. Um, and so so there's a lot of activism in, in a great expansion. For example, a lot of people here on the island are worried about food security. Now, no matter what political aspect you belong to, left or right, A lot of people are worried about food security because if there was a huge catastrophic event here on the island, the ferries that transfer the petrol, the food, everything that we get would be shut down. And so if that was the case, the question asks, where do we get our food from and how would that happen? Uh, There's a lot of people that are afraid of that. So no matter what political ideology, left or right, that you believe in everybody agrees in food security is an issue so that's just one example of how on the island people are really they come together and they they fight for our security here on the island so it's it's quite an amazing place to to be in plus there's a lot of activists um that you know they know about chemtrails they know about 9-11 they know about the the growing police state um and they're very active in their feeling like here in victoria we have dr tim ball who's a renowned climatologist, um, and we've interviewed him on our shows. I brought him on my channel, my YouTube channel, many times. And uh, he's he's a huge uh, activist uh, against the global warming enthusiasts, and, and he gets a lot of flack. He's had, you know, um, lawsuits from Dr. Andrew Weaver, who here in Victoria, he's an MLA, a member of Legislative Assembly, uh, he was one of the individuals who actually wrote the, or was on the IPCC, writing the document. So right here in Victoria, we got a lot of powerhouses on both sides of the left and right paradigm, and uh, I'm privileged to be here and 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 partake in it. So it's kind of cool. Yeah, I'm looking on um, a website, and it's 32,000 square kilometers, 12,355 square miles. Vancouver Island is the largest North American island in the Pacific Ocean. And it's a mountain. It has a mountainous spine, 
that runs its whole length, breaks it into long mountain fjords along its west coast, and the population of Vancouver Island region is 726,000. And it's broken up into 700,593 for Vancouver Island and 18,926 for the southern Gulf Islands. Yeah, and the Gulf Islands are a, a handful, maybe 10 or 12 islands, small little tiny islands that uh, it, a lot of, I, wouldn't, I shouldn't say hippies, but Salt Spring Island, if you Google that, it's, it's a very cool little island. It's one of the bigger of the Gulf Islands. And again, they're even more protecting of their uh, ideologies of, of their own land, of their own development. And um, so there's an aspect of... of power in those islands because the people get together and you know all your neighbors and you you don't police each other but you know one of the impacts that i've had one one thing that i've noticed is with this global community of online world it's great however it's a double-edged sword like i've got 500 friends on facebook but the intimacy i have with them will never be as intimate as i do with my local community and so in my opinion um with my activism it's, I get, like I said, it's not about quantity, but it's about quality. So I try and focus my activism here on the island. Yes, I broadcast to the world, as you do and most other people do, because we have the technology. But when you can actually talk to someone face-to-face, when you can bring a speaker to town and publicize it, when you can do a local TV show and put it on your local cable access television, um... And then people see you in the mall, or people see you, and they and you can have that conversation. It's so much more powerful. Face to face relationship, in my opinion, and in my experience, is is like a hundred times more powerful than armchair behind a computer screen relationship management. You know. Yeah, I was actually thinking about all that um, today. I was thinking about how the human body and being. Uh, it has so many different layers and levels. So let's start with the body. You have a body. I have never seen you in your body. I only know you in your voice and through emails and that kind of thing. So we we have never met. So from the body, in the body, there's the brain. The brain is part of the body. And then somehow within the brain or uh, as a consequence of having a brain, we have a mind, right? So there's body, brain, mind. And then there is this thing that emerges from the kind of mind we have, which I call the person. So the person is a product of the body, the brain, the mind. And the person is also a being, in an even bigger sense, because the person exists and has characteristics and is and does. So there's body, brain, mind, person, being. And then, emerging from and out of the person and the being is the soul. It's either contained in it or it comes from it. But the soul is a presence as well that people sense. And then... Around and from all of that is the spirit, because people have distinct spirits. Mm -hmm. And those may actually, you know, uh, remain after they leave their body. So, you, you know, we get to know people and we pick up what kind of mind they have. We get a sense for what kind of person they are. Then they feel their own being. Oh, and I forgot to throw in the self. They have a self. Now, I can't feel yourself, you can, but I can feel your personness. So all these are layers of us, and they all come together, in, and they are the way that we are operating here in this third dimensional world. And I was trying to figure out what elements of what I just described, this chain, what elements are strictly third dimension and what start having foot um, feet planted in other dimensions as well you know mm-hmm. yeah like you, that's a good point you say that the, your spirit um, a good mentor of mine uh, he used to talk about I can't remember the actual German word for it but uh, it's like the umptwelt I, I, I can't remember the actual three different words but it was the relationship I have with 
nature, the relationship I have with other people, and the relationship I have with myself. And you, Sophia, will never know the relationship and communication I have with myself. And the communication I have with you is separate from what the communication I have from with nature. And he talked about these three worlds that you live in at all times and the, the, the importance of understanding those three. I think, pe- I think spirits gravitate to each other because you, Sophia, have a lot of those same spiritual qualities, those spirits. And when, when my friend died in front of me, he physically, egotistically died. His body, his carnal being died. But the spirit of George Ford didn't leave. In fact, it's still with me. And that's the kind of way I see my life and um, the, 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 the greater aspect of life. And, and that kind of gives me comfort to know that, you know, it's, it's, I'm not just this one soul being on this planet and that's it and then you're dead because it's, I, see a, I see a certain characteristic in you that I gravitate to uh, versus what I don't gravitate to. And I think that's what you're saying there is, is, is very true. There's all these different aspects. And to go even further in what you said, the heart, the heart, uh, what's that saying? The heart, you can't, the heart doesn't speak. You have to listen to the heart. And I find the heart is like an analog frequency. And so when I'm speaking to you online here through this thing called Skype, it's a bunch of ones and zeros. And you can hear my tonality hot, raise and, and depress, which expresses my emotion. However, you can't feel the analog vibrations that I will actually emit to you if you were in my presence. And mm-hmm. that's the way the Internet has, you know, like we, you do a Skype conversation and I can see you and you can see me, but that's not really you and that's not really me. That's an image of myself. And in law, they call that the person or the persona, the mask, what you wear, the taxpayer, the driver, the, 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 individ, the, the person, that's the actual word, persona. And that's the image you wear, whereas when you take that mask off, it's nothing but analog, like real vibrations and that's why i think when you can have a relationship with someone in the flesh it's a lot more powerful because body language and facial expressions speak a lot louder than the physical words like i know and i kind of know when someone's lying to me i know when someone's trying to deceive me i know when someone has is feeling uncomfortable they don't need to say anything i can know i know when they're feeling uncomfortable there's a intellectual um, emotional intelligence that's involved that i think we all have everybody has different levels of it and it's how much you practice that and and like anything in life if you practice you get better at it so uh, i agree with you 100 percent with with what you, your analyzation of the human body, the mind, the body, the soul, the character, the spirit, the person, all of those things. Well, yeah, they're all different parts that wrap up into this whole. And um, so what I have picked up from you, Paul, is that positivity. And you know I interviewed David Icke last week, mm-hmm. and he is convinced that this is all going to work out. And I, I meet lots of people or a fair number of people who think we're going to prevail, um, either something's going to come in to save us, or we're going to save ourselves from this upside-down reality that you know we live in, where most of the people in power are literally trading in evil, mm-hmm. and they're using us as uh, fodder and, uh, uh, what's it called, resource, nat- uh, we're a natural resource to them in their uh, tra- evil trades. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, here you are, you're in your 30s, and you're coming into your prime if you're not in it already. And so what you're doing, the way you are living your life with your activism, your, you know, idealism, your your pure, uh, powerful idealism, that's a great way to be, given the fact that we're all in this world together, and there are a lot of people here who aren't doing that at all. They don't want to know. They don't care to know. They stay in the matrix, and they believe on some level that they can just walk through it and get out the other side and still be okay and have had, a, I guess, a good life. But at any time, some element or aspect of the matrix can clamp down on you and turn your life into pure hell. It could be through illness, because you followed the wrong, you know, um, uh, prescriptions and protocols 
uh, remember when they told us to avoid fats altogether <laughs> and everybody was low fat everything and yet they were as big as cows. Yeah. And um, anyway, and they still are. So David Icke was explaining to me, and everyone can hear the show and hear it for themselves, how our our beings in this world are actually phantom. He calls it the phantom self, mm. and it's a bunch of layers of um, the adoption of beliefs and positions that are sold to us and we're trained in, and they form this kind of onion, this kind of uh, shell that we walk around in. Mm-hmm. And our awakening on this earth consists of peeling those layers off. And we don't ever really use our true selves or know it because the matrix supplies us with so many layers of cover and that end up being the shell that we transact through and with. And so many of us don't even want to take it take it down because that is a process of that takes you into, you know, great deep vulnerability, the unknown. You become unknown to yourself even. So but he's still very convinced that this is all going to work out. We are going to prevail. Our we who are awake are going to pass that awakening on to everyone else and the world is going to turn into a, an organism, you could say, that it will self-correct and we'll all be able to enjoy that process. So what do you think? I, I, yeah, I, I like what he has to say. I like David Icke and what he's brought to a lot of people and uh, I agree with a lot of what he had to say in your last podcast. Um, I, 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 I do agree with what he has to say, and I'm not going to say but, or I'm not going to negate what he has to say. I think this, this, this life, though, I think it's a playground for us. And um, how do I say it? It's, it's not about we. It is because we're all the same, but it's more about you, I believe. It's more, more about me. And so um, I, I kind of see that some people will never wake up. And I don't believe that there will be a prevailing I don't believe that one day the good will take over because that's the duality thinking. I kind of think this place is is supposed to be this way. I, I, I love nature and I love natural law. I love studying what is versus what you presume or what you what, what our beliefs are. And I say, if you know, I've always said this, you know, if uh, if a meteorite hit the earth and killed all human beings, but but nature still survived and the cloud settled. And the dust settled, and there's no human beings. I ask, would would the would the birds still chirp in the morning? And I'd say, yeah. And I'd say, you know, would the dog still howl? Or the wolf still howl at the full moon? And I I, th- I think they would. But would the church bells ring on Sunday mornings? And I don't think they would, because that's a belief system. And and if you want to know the difference between what is real versus what is actual, uh, you look at nature and kind of just. Observe, observe, and just look at nature. So, I kind of observe the way humanity is, and it's been a huge, you know, growing for me over the past ten, fifteen years of knowing what I know. Uh, by the way, I was raised in a, a kind of Judeo-Christian cult, um, and right from the get-go, right from you know, as far as I can remember, I always had questions that contradicted, that couldn't be answered, that were you know, uh, apostasy, that were all these things, right? So. I just kind of look at life, and I, I don't think there's a... I think the, the duality of life, which is death, the duality of white, which is black, is important. Both are important. Uh, and I think this life, in my opinion, is more of a training ground for the eternity that is before and after. I'm not much of a religious believer, but you know, in the Bible it says that God is from time indefinite to time indefinite. And, and my mind can't wrap around that in this in this world that with the belief systems that I have, but when I go expansive, uh, I understand that, well, yeah, like everything must die on this planet. Everything has to have a death because this, it's like we're living in two worlds, the world of the super highway consciousness up top, which exists, which I believe we all go to when we sleep. And that's where we actually get our information and transfer our data back and forth. And this physical world that I wake up and I turn on CNN and I look at my diploma on the wall and, you know, and it sure looks real. I drive my car and I smell the stinky gas in front of me, the diesel smoke, and it smells real. And so I, I don't think that there's necessarily going to be a prevailing or anything. I think it's like our lungs. 
things expand and they contract and they expand or a pendulum, it goes from a left to zero point to right to zero point to left. And I, I kind of see that in almost everything in nature. And so that's, again, I, it kind of removes Paul Stein from the picture and says, well, what is? And, you know, I, was, I just had a good friend whose mother died a couple of days ago. And uh, we were talking about it. And I said, you know, we're, we had this exact same conversation, how people are waking up, people are, you know. But I, I said, you know, Brad, it's like, I think back in Egypt days when the slaves were building the castle or the pyramids or whatever, I think there was a guy just like you named Brad. And he was doing the exact same thing you did. And he's saying, it's happening. It's, but that was 6,000 years ago or whatever that, how many years that was. And today it's just a snapshot. Again, time, the, the, the measurement of time is a very complicated thing. I think a lot of this is, is what I've recently you know, kind of aligned myself with is that someone who's angry with me, someone who's yelling at me, it really has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with that individual and what they don't know about themselves. Um, a good friend of mine said, has taught me something and I've, I've, I've realized it. And that is, and it's just a small example. It's an analogy. What we know is 1%. So I know I'm Paul Stein. I know I like to run. I know I like strawberries. I know I, I am a painter. I know this. Um, that's what I know, 1%. What I don't know is also 1%. So, for example, I don't know how to fly a plane. I know that. I know that I don't know how to fly a plane. Um, I don't have any children. So I know that I don't know what it's like to have a child. However, 98% of the rest is what we don't know we don't know. And in that area is what we call miracles, is what we call fear. That area, 98% of what we don't know we don't know is what... We've been what our beliefs tell us not to go there. Ever ever since when I was a young kid, I I would you know do not go down that hall. I would try I'd venture down that hall. Do not do this. I would do that, and and it turns out to not be exactly as they said. Right, nine eleven. Oh, the Arabs did nine eleven. They but I go down that alley, and I and I and I realize it's not true. And so I think a lot of life has to do with our own experience and how we see it and how we project it to a lot of people. And, and once we own not only our, 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 our failures and our wins, once we fully accept that, well, then when you get cancer, when someone close to you dies, you realize truly how, how powerless we really are in the sense that we're just a being here experiencing reality. Pain is just an experience. Fear is just an experience. Love is just an orgasm. All of these things are just experiences. However, we create them to be good or bad, left or right. And that is what determines your perception of life. And I think that kind of, like you said, with the, there's a, another quote I live by, and that's everything, everything, everything. M my role as an activist is no different necessarily than when I'm giving an estimate for the painting company that I work with. There is, I'm no different. You can talk to me here on, the, on, on Skype. You can meet me for the first time at a gas station or I'll pull over and help you or, or I'll go with my men's team in Victoria here and we'll go down to the Avatar Grove in Port Renfrew, which is the southern tip of Vancouver Island where there's huge old growth trees and we'll just build trail so that people can enjoy these trails. And me, Paul Stein, I try not to be any different of a character. So I'm not one person in one scenario and then one person in another scenario. What I try and be is as authentic as I can at all times. And that's knowing that I screw up all the time. Every day I screw up. But owning it, owning my screw ups. Every time you point at someone, you've got three pointing back at you, three, three fingers pointing back at you. And I think that's an analogy that plays true. And as human beings, we have a hard time accepting um, – what we can control, what we can't control, and the ability to know the difference. So I, I do agree with everything that David Icke has to say and his journey and what he's discovering. Um, I just think that uh, as individuals, it's more about what we feel. And I've stopped saying, well, the world needs to do this and the world needs to do that and people are stupid. I've stopped saying that because all I know is what Paul Stein is. And I say, I need to improve on this. I like that. I feel this way. I feel that way. I think this. I can't project my... Um, my beliefs onto you. Otherwise, I'm just creating what I don't want. So that's my kind of philosophy behind it. And it's, I think it pairs up right along with what David Icke says and with what a lot of people says. It might just be a little bit different. That's all. That's all. After he <laughs> talks for 20 minutes. Sorry. <laughs> no, but the 98% um, 
picture that you painted, those are one of that's one of the profundities of talking to Paul. So that to me is something that I can take away and uh, play with now after this talk. That the fact is we only know one percent. We know we don't know one percent. And then the 98% is this enormous expanse of all kinds of unknowns. And I don't mean to sound like Rumsfeld, because you did kind of... <laughs> well, he spoke a truth, but, though. That's the thing. Just because it's Rumsfeld doesn't mean he's, he doesn't speak truth. Yes, I understand you know, who he is, and the, you know, but he didn't create that. He's just speaking a truth. And we're antennas of truth and lies. And we can deliver lies or we can deliver truth. So, yeah, carry on. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, we have to be able to say, Rumsfeld is bad. <laughs> well, that, I don't like Rumsfeld. Yeah. I like strawberries. <laughs> no, Paul. Um, strawberries are the most pesticided of uh, fruit. So you've got to eat organic strawberries if you're going to eat them at all. Mm-hmm. But anyway, the not, the not traveled, the road not traveled, because you don't even know about it, that's where all the surprises are and that's what really shapes you when you start out on your true path if you want to call it that you referred me to a video uh, a week ago that I thought was funny and very good at first and then it kind of got a little bit confusing and overdone and it was this Mark Gungor Um, He is apparently a pastor of sorts, and he uh, is a comic as well, or comedian, and he uh, had given a talk that's on YouTube titled The Tale of Two Brains, Mm -hmm. and he was describing the differences between a woman's way of thinking, you could say, and a man's way of thinking. And if you... I will attach it to this uh, show description because it's very worth watching. It's very, very funny. Um, and we are different. Every, every person is different, but the way that the genders think differently is of note. And we've all had that experience, the one that he talks about um, and describes. And so that got me thinking as well. And... I came up with my own little takeoff on Mark Gungor, who says, for people who haven't seen him, I don't know if I'm saying his name correctly, that men um, have a box for everything in their brain. And he doesn't talk about the mind. So the car has its own box. The, his job has a box. His uh, wife has a box. His kids have a box. His uh, hobbies have each a box, and no box touches any of the other boxes. So men think in a very separating way. They deal with one thing at a time, and they're primarily interested in solving problems if they happen to know of any problems in that box, right? Mm -hmm. And women, by contrast, they don't have a box for anything. Everything is all bunched and tangled and wired together and they everything relates to everything else your her husband is re, is linked to his job it's linked to the kids it's linked to the money it's linked to everybody else's family and kids and money and everything is all connected and wired and buzzing and humming and it's all run by emotion and when he you know shows his audience he's got these almost like plaster models of heads, a male and a female, and he stands over each one and describes what's going on in that kind of a brain or mind. And then um, the audience is screaming with laughter, and all the men and women are nodding their heads because they get it, because that's what they go through with their wives and their husbands. So I was thinking about it, and I decided that women are primarily problem finders, And men are problem solvers. So women are always finding and seeing what's wrong with something. It could be their relationship. It could be their, uh, you know, weight and their body or um, 
something, you know, the food at the restaurant or the way you cook or the way so-and-so talks. And they discuss this with their man and he, in the effort to be as helpful as possible, says, well, why don't you do this? Mm -hmm. And the woman, because that's how she's made, finds fault with that suggestion. And she says, but yes, if I do that, but... So she's a yes butter. So women will continue to find a problem with every solution that the man proposes. And by the time he's proposed 12 different solutions, uh, perhaps to different things, but everything is connected to everything and a problem emerges from everything he suggests, he's exhausted. Mm -hmm. And the, the woman isn't. The woman is quite, you know, still pepped up and she thinks they've had a very good talk Mm -hmm. and he walks away frustrated and uh kind of shaking his head well that's you know i'm 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 really fascinated in in what that video i showed you and more predominantly the communication between men and women i've got three older sisters and i also take a look in the world and i see there's this this division between men and women feminism and masculinity and all these things um and and the reason why I sent you that is because he speaks, he resonates with some truth about what that is. I would argue that it's not so much a, a gender specific thing, such as male and female. I would say it's more masculine and feminine. I think in our conversation, I, I know a lot of you know same sex lesbians, same sex uh, men, gays, and in their relationship, there's a masculine and there's a feminine, and there's there there's that yin yang, there's that totality again. Uh, that you notice out there um, and you said how the men have the boxes and the women have and everything is interrelated one big wire zone I just recently read a, a blog post the other day and they talked about how men when they communicate they duel and when women communicate they duet they dance and it's funny because when you watch a circle of men talking usually there's one man talking and then when he's done the next man talks and then when he's done talking the next man talks and then when he's done talking the next man talks and when generally and this this is just very generalized speaking when you watch a group of women speaking usually they kind of talk together and they dance the the communication technique is more of a dance Um, men pre-plan their thoughts they think about what they're going to say and then they say it um, I, that's generally speaking, that's what I find. And men have a hard time listening. And every woman in the world will say, men don't listen, men don't listen. But the truth is, is that men, we do listen. We just don't know, we've never been taught the communication of the feminine. And um, I went to a men's weekend and they kind of, you know, I didn't buy everything they said, but they said, you know, a woman's brain is like a radio. and 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 it's just, it's got all these different frequencies playing at the same time. And as a man, our, as a man, generally speaking, we're good at fixing shit and breaking shit. That's what we're good at. But we're not necessarily good at listening. Listening and just being a sounding board. And that's one thing. When they said that, I was like, whoa, that's like a profound moment for me because that's so true. I get along with a lot of women. And when my wife talks I think to myself, she said that four times already. Why is she saying? Why is she saying that again? Why is she saying that again? But the reality is that she needs to get it out, out of her mouth, in order to see and organize her thoughts. Whereas a man organizes his thoughts in his brains in those little compartments, and then he speaks it. And one is not right, and one is not wrong. It's just the communication technique. If I go to China and I speak English, no one's going to understand me. And likewise, if China Chinese guy comes here and he speaks Mandarin, well, then I'm not necessarily going to understand him, and there's going to be conflict. So it's understanding, I think, a big uh, coming back to uh, humanity and uh, loving each other is about l- learning how to communicate properly with, with people. And the communication style of a dog, or a dog, a man, versus a communication style of a woman. And that's, I was never taught that, not in school and TV, propaganda taught me that, you know, the man slams the door on the wife, she cries on the couch, he comes back, they have mad sex, and that's what relationships are all about. But that's the fabricated relationship. And no wonder today's society, we have 50% divorce rates. I'm not going to get into the whole, you know, sociological aspect of that, but I, I noticed that, like, I used to follow those same patterns, and 
uh, you know, it's, you already told me that twice already. You don't need to tell me that again. Or she, my wife would come to me and say, you know, I've got this girlfriend that's, she does this. Oh, why don't you do this? Why don't you just fix that? Oh, I know how to fix that. But at the end of the day, Paul Stein wasn't doing his job as a man, as a masculine, and that is shut up and listen and let her figure out her own problems. And once I realized that, it was like, wow, that's, People need to speak. I'm all about free speech. And, I, and I, I connected those two things. That free speech has everything to do with being heard. It's, it's, it's like poison. If I've drank in poison, my body will naturally want to puke it out. But hate speech and not listening to people is like putting duct tape on their mouth and expecting you to digest it. And that's only going to make you sicker. So when someone eats poison, a poisonous berry or drinks poison, what's the best thing to do is like, Drink milk and puke it up, you know, put your finger down and puke it up, right? So when you allow someone to actually express how they feel with no judgment and no, um, no helping, just as an observer, just as a sounding board, just as a quote-unquote witness, a witness to the experience, you actually provide a lot of power to that person which they will find their own solutions. I don't remember ever, I don't remember who woke me up. And in fact, I don't think anybody ever woke me up. I think I woke myself up. And it was through the friends that allowed me to communicate. So that I said, well, that was a stupid thing to say. Or that really hit hard. Or just letting my spirit say what needs to be said. Um, and then reflecting on that. So when it comes to men and women, masculine and feminine, I sent you that video just simply because uh, it rang true. And there's some truth to it. Not everything is true, of course. But... I find it very fascinating that men and women, especially in my age, I'm 36, and a lot of my friends, men, are single. And a lot of them say, I don't want, I don't want, a, I don't want a wife, I don't want kids, I just want to... And a lot of women are saying the same thing. And then I ask myself, is this truly how they feel, or is this part of the programming that David Icke talks about? Is this part of the programming that we've been taught, that we've been, you know, and, and what is it that stops us from wanting relationships with other people and committing, actually committing because when you commit to something, then it's it's really hard to shut up and listen sometimes. But sometimes that's all people need is just to be heard. So for men and women, my idea is just practice listening and understand that every man, men and women have different languages, just like a dog has a different language. It doesn't speak English. However, most people know when a dog needs to go pee. Most people know when a dog wants love. Most people know when a dog wants wants to be fed. And you're speaking that language of the dog, even though it has nothing to do with English. But you're understanding the dog. And if men and women could understand each other a little bit better in their language and communication techniques, I think we would have, we would get woken up a lot faster. And and the powers that be, the New World Order, they, they love dividing and conquer masculine and femininity and uh, men and women. And, you know, we've got these social justice feminist warriors out there that just shut up everybody. And then you've got these the opposite polar opposite men's groups that hate women and, you know, hate feminists. And it's like, well, you know what? If you both just listen to each other, you might get somewhere rather than shutting each other up, right? So, Well, our mixing of the sexes, um, the transgender movement, is going to bring those masculine and feminine polarities and differences much closer together. Mm -hmm. And uh, this separation is probably going to be better blended rather than being distinctly separate in the coming generations. But that's not a consequence of training. I think it's a consequence of a blurring biology. Mm -hmm. So what you're talking about, you know, first you made the distinction when I explained the video that will be linked to this. Everybody should watch it. It's very funny. Mm. Um you explained that it's actually more a matter of feminine and masculine than men and women. But then as you concluded your uh, last uh, uh, session in this interview, you said you went back to the terms men and women. So yeah, I use it we are. I use it kind of loosely, but there is a dis yeah. dis distinction between a man and a woman. Absolutely. Sure. But there's also a yeah, distinction Yeah, and there between... needs to be. Hmm. We need to have those distinctions, and we need to... Um, Respect. We need to experience the way the other thinks. And men do have good problem-solving suggestions. They just don't have all their boxes wired together talking to each other and the radio on full blast on all frequencies. So I'm guessing that they don't logically see 
the problems that are possible when you have everything connected together and all stations playing at once. I mean, they, they propose a solution to A because that's what you told them about, A. And they don't necessarily expect that A is connected to B and B is going to throw a problem into the solution you just proposed. So it could be that they wait. You know, they always say, don't worry about what hasn't happened yet. And women do. And they are much more... Um, uh, the what if personality than the so what personality, which is another distinction I made for myself many, many years ago, that there are two kinds of people, what ifs and so what. Interesting. Yeah, and they're always marrying one another. Mm-hmm. It's not always the man who's the so what, but I, I've said this on a couple of shows, um, so I don't want to repeat myself, but the what if personality is constantly worried and constantly thinking ahead and trying to cover all possibilities and arrange for all um, issues that might crop up. And the problem with being a what if is that you basically ruin your life. You sit there and you sweat and you uh, your teeth chatter and you're always a what if is always bringing stuff up to her husband. It's usually women that are what ifs I've found, and they often marry or almost always marry so what. That's true. Yeah, polar opposites. They kind of attract, right? Like. Well, the reason is in um, you could say I call it the bio psyche, um, a very primitive uh, psyche that exists in the biological. Now here we are back at our beings and whatnot. The body is biologically programmed and hardwired to do certain things, and the biopsyche is identical from one uh, man to the next, one woman to the next. It's a very basic part of us that uh, is run on, that is connected to our neurology and everything else, our hormones. And so the biopsyche knows that we are a worry wart, and it knows that an experience with a so what is going to round us out. We're going to learn, even though they will, there will be perhaps hellish conflict in this kind of relationship with two very opposite types, they're going to rub off on each other. The so what is going to benefit from living with a what if, mm-hmm. and is not going to, you know, go... I mean, so what's will go bankrupt, they'll lose their house, <laughs> they'll wreck their car or not make payments and have it repossessed, and they just say, so what? They start again. So true. <laughs> it's, it's great. I would envy so what. I would think, my God, they have such a great life. They don't even care. They're just remarkable. And what I realized after I thought about it for a long time was, besides the fact that we're trying to round ourselves out, The what if is trying to become less of a what if, a little more of a so what. The so what is trying to plan a little more ahead and get the positive um, uh, precaution um, taking qualities of the what if. But I saw that there was a flip side to what if and so what. Mm -hmm. And even though what ifs were worry warts and had a terrible life possibly as a consequence of this, nervousness, nervous Nelly behavior. The flip side of what if is creativity. Because creativity is saying, what if? What if I paint my room purple? What if I put this together with this? What will I get? And that's the plus of being a what if. And the plus of being a so what is this kind of resilience and personal power and strength. Something bad happens, you move on. You know, so they each have their plus side. And that's, I think, what they also absorb from one another when they are connected. What ifs and so what's getting married. But if you think about the people you know, they're usually what ifs and so what's paired. Yeah, and another another idea that I heard which resonated well with me in, re- in, re- relation, in, in respect to relationships, men and women, masculine and feminine, um, I have always avoided conflict. I've always tried to not get in conflict, be the nice passive Canadian, sorry, excuse me, pardon me, you know, like, and 
I, that has a lot to do with my belief system and the presumptions that I have, uh, my upbringing. However, I, I heard a, I, I heard someone say something. I can't remember where, but they talked about how, in order to get a sharp edge on a knife, you need friction. Um, and in relationships, that friction is actually important. Now, understanding the respect of having that friction, the so what versus the what if. You know, when you're like, oh, you're always doing that. You're always doing that. See, there's that project and you're pointing, you're blaming. That's not very healthy. But understanding and respecting that edge. It's like when you sharpen a knife, there is an actual friction happening. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a conflict between the stone and the edge of the knife. And it's that friction, that, that constant friction that makes the knife sharp. And if you never do that, the knife will go dull. And relationships, I find, without that friction, can go dull. And in that dullness, you start to resent each other. And you, next, next thing you know, you've, you've fallen apart. And you now you, we come up with all these realizations or these ideologies why we've fallen apart. Again, mostly blame. But at the end of the day, my wife and I, we have, we have conflict but we can respect each other's conflict and we can understand and learn from each other's conflict, which makes our relationship sharp. Because for me, when I tell my wife something, she trusts that I'm telling her the truth. She knows I'm telling her the truth, even though it may not be what she wants to hear. She knows. And that's that edge that I'm talking about, that conflict that is important in all relationships so that you get feedback so that you keep your relationship sharp and on that edge and when i heard that say that i was like wow it's like you know i wish tv would talk to us about this stuff i wish i wish we could see the the totality of what he's saying there but why is it that i'm 36 and finally learning about this now i realize because it's my journey and that's where i'm at so uh, i share that with your your listeners and if that resonates with you i hope that helps if not Tell me why, and it's, it's cool. But that edge is really important, and the respecting of that, uh, respecting of people's beliefs and allowing them to say what they need to say and listen. It's, it's part of learning, right? Right. And, Paul, I want to bring up here, because I've been, I've been uh, familiar with this concept for many years. A psychologist that I was working with um, described it to me, explained it to me, and it changed my life. And I've taught it to other people, and they have told me it's one of the most profound things they've ever learned, and they know it's going to change their life. So I will bring it up now. It's called the Drama Triangle, and it was um, laid out in the 1960s by a psychologist, I believe he was, called Stephen Karpman. And I think that's K-A-R-P-M-A-N-N, Karpman. Uh, Stephen Cartman Drama Triangle. So the way it works is that the Drama Triangle is kind of like a baseball diamond. It's not on a field or anything. It's figurative. But it's not a diamond with four corners. It's a triangle with three corners. So there are three bases to the Drama Triangle, three positions. And they are called Victim, Persecutor, and Rescuer. And these positions are typical and very commonly found in many, many, many human relationships, perhaps the majority of human relationships, whether they're romantic relationships or other another kind of relationship. Friends are often in the drama triangle together. And what happens is you don't have to be three people. You can be two. You can be more than two. But... Um, People chase each other around those bases. So the victim will cry and moan and talk about, you know, the terrible predicament he or she is in. And the other person who will decide to be the rescuer says, well, all right, I'll help you. So it usually starts with a victim and a rescuer. And typically the rescuer over rescues over supplies, over performs, and this is a habit with the rescuer and ends up becoming resentful. So the rescuer may run up to the persecutor base and yell at the victim and say, you know what, I've done this and this and this for you, and what have you done for me? And the victim gets affronted and 
Chase runs up to the persecutor base and pushes the rescuer off and says, no, 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 no. You promised to do all those things. And I never said I would do such and such for you. And so they, they play this triangle thing where they rush and push each other off another base and then maybe the rescuer run down to the victim's base and say yeah but what about when such and such happened and my father died and you were supposed to do this and you didn't do it nobody helped me so the way to get off the drama triangle if you should find yourself there there are four rules to not being on it or getting off it and those are in many ways the golden rules of dealing with other people Rule number one, don't help if you don't want to. Mm -hmm. That is utterly and entirely your option. Don't help if you don't want to. Rule number two is never do more than 50% of the work. Hmm. Rule number three is don't help without a contract. That doesn't mean you have to draw this up with the help of a lawyer. It doesn't mean it has to be anything written. It means there have to be clear terms yes. to why you're helping, what you will do. That's, you know, delineating it up to the 50% and what you expect in return. And these terms, the contract, these terms have to be overt. They have to be out in the open. They have to be known by all parties. And understood. They cannot be covert, hidden, silent, unspoken. Mm -hmm. So, don't help if you don't want to. Never do more than 50% of the work. Don't help without a contract. And rule number four is, no one is helpless unless they are lying unconscious on the ground, knocked out cold. That's when they're really helpless. Otherwise, they're not helpless. And what you're getting in Drama Triangle is somebody, the victim, the person who's predominantly the victim, claiming that they're helpless. I, I need this. and No one is doing this for me. And I, I never get such and such. And you get someone who's the rescuer feeling sorry for that person and deciding because it's their nature to lend a hand and doing more than 50% of the work, not getting it clear as to what they might get back for giving all this help. And then you end up in the drama triangle, chasing each other around those bases, and it goes on and on and on and on and on for years. And a quality of the drama triangle is it's extremely predictable. You already know that if you say this, he or she is going to say or do that. That's how predictable it is. So predictable behavior, predictable relationships that are not gratifying are drama triangle relationships. Wow, that's, and that's powerful. That's, I like that. I really like that. Everything you said Isn't there. it? It's great. And what I learned from this psychologist was it is relationships that are unpredictable that are the powerful, healthy relationships. Those are the ones you want. Mm -hmm. You want friendships that are unpredictable, meaning you don't know what this person is going to say if such and such happens. They are going to surprise you <laughs> in a good way. Yeah. So those four rules, to me, became very important in my life. And... Whenever something happened and I said to myself, wow, I'm on a drama triangle with this person or this situation, I would then remember the rules and work out a way to get off. Sometimes it means you just don't engage. You stop engaging and you realize, you know what? I did more than 50% of the work. This is helpful to me in my life. I'm going to get something. If that's all I get from this. That's powerful. I, I, I really resonate with the one having terms. I've I've struggled with that a lot of my life. And in my men's team we we practice that and you know, we go through that and we say, What's your terms with your relationships? With your work relationships, with your relationships with your family and and uh I really, really struggled with that for a long time and and I I realized I didn't have that many terms. Or like you said, my terms were covert. And yeah. it's like, Wow, wow. 
how important is it to put it out there and let it be known for the record, for the public record, you know, put it out there and, and let people know your terms. And then, as you said, don't help if they don't, if they don't want the help. If there, no one's helpless. No, if you don't want to help. You know, there are people who help because they feel like they should. Yes. And that's when you're getting into trouble. You're getting into deep water. And if you help because you feel like you need to and you don't have any terms laid out and you don't have it in your mind that, okay, at this point I'm going to stop helping because this person isn't helpless. Because rule number four is they're not helpless unless they're lying, knocked out Mm -hmm. on the floor, unconscious. They can always appeal to somebody else, you know. I mean, that's a form of not being helpless. They don't have to come to you and just drink and drain you. So these drama triangle pointers and the concept of the drama triangle, and you see it, you see it in so many people's lives. Yeah, I, I, I resonate with that, having wanting to help people um, and, and the, in the relationship with burning out. Uh, I've been doing activism for many years, and I've burnt out a couple times. And I'd say 90% of the people that I have done activism with also burn out. And I think what you just said there is a direct correlation to why they burn out. And that is, A, they don't have their, their, their terms, and they don't have their terms down, and they, they, just, they feel compelled to help someone. But at the same time, maybe that person doesn't want your help or doesn't need the help. And that energy that you're putting into it be- turns into resentment. And then you start prosecuting, calling them sheeple, calling them stupid, whatever it is. And then next thing you know, you're in this downward spiral. And I, what you just said there, really, uh, I really resonate that with that because I, I, I was in that position for many years until I had to step away and, and just let it go and, and uh, just observe. So I really appreciate you bringing that and, and telling me that. I've never heard that before. But I think there's a lot of power involved in that. Well, thank you, Paul. I mean, all I did was deliver something I learned many years ago. But you brought the drama triangle into activism, into the subject of activism, which I find also something we need to discuss, all of us, because we do this. We get out there and we hand out flyers and we give people DVDs in the days when we used to. Today we send them YouTubes and... The thing I hear the most from people is how many people in their lives, usually friends, relatives, co-workers, they've sent YouTubes to and they don't even watch them. They start arguing right away or they watch 30 seconds and they start arguing. So you're back at help that's unwanted, a rescuer trying to give help to someone who is not the victim in this case, but turns into the persecutor and starts arguing and resisting. Yeah. and finding fault with the material you are trying to offer them. And the rescuer may turn into the victim and say, yes, but, you know, you have to know this because it's going to happen to you. And one of the the languaging of victims, one of the terms they always use is yes, but. Yes, but. You offer the victim a solution and the victim says, yes, but. I can't do that because... <laughs> And the but negates what they just said, right? That's what the word right. but does. It negates what you just said, and the word try implies failure. Yes, but I'll try later. Well, <laughs> yes, you just negated that, and try it says you imply failure, so it's not going to happen. I think that's powerful in because, like you said, these these they're habits, and you can you can tell it because it's predictable. And I see that in a lot of activists here on in Vancouver Island, in Victoria, and around the world, and how they just lose it. And uh, I think there has to be some kind of balance involved where we understand that we can only do so much. You can only you can only wake up so many people. But the truth is, is you should put more energy into waking yourself up and, and unlocking the areas that are um, that are, are tightened. Like Brian Tracy, uh, he's a motivational speaker. I've listened to him many times. He talks about a thing called psychosclerosis, and it's a hardening of the attitude. And I found that I had, and it's hard to swallow, but I had, and I still do have psychosclerosis, and that's a hardening of my attitudes, of what I believe to be true. And uh, every time I'm confronted with something that I find in another person, I I have now practice stop, turn around, put it back. Well, why is that? Why is that bothering me? Why is this coming in for me? You know. 
And then I understand that, oh, I've got a psychosclerosis in this aspect of my life. Well, let's, let's explore what the opposite to that is. Like you said, what's the opposite of this? Um, and once you, once you go there, you're now activating your mind and your soul and your spirit. And you're actually doing, quote unquote, the work that needs to be done rather than projecting it out on people and ex- expecting them to do their work. And I say always, it's like trying to teach a grade three tri- trigonometry. And you get mad and frustrated because the kid doesn't understand. But the reality is, is, he's in grade three. He needs to learn a lot more fundamentals before he can learn trigonometry. And if we understand that, then you'll no- you won't waste your time trying to employ that and, and getting angry that you're not getting the results that you want. At least that's what I noticed in myself. And uh, it's a humbling experience, but at the same time, it's, you know, every day I wake up, it's like, what do I know? I really don't know much. And everything I think I know most likely isn't totally true because in five years from now, I probably won't have the same convictions that I have today. So knowing that, if I practice that, um, I'm open to exploring that 98% of what I don't know I don't know and how what I believe to be true which isn't true is actually preventing me from achieving my purpose here as Paul Stein and uh, I'm not saying everybody has a purpose but once I understand that then I can tune in and uh, align more with what works and I find in my experience when I kind of just take a step back and become an observer and look inward rather than outward I get better results, and uh, more people see that too. So I think that's what we all, uh, that's what I practice, and uh, I, I, I wish other people would do the same. And, and I see you doing it, and I see other, a lot of people doing it. I think that's, like David Icke says, it's happening. That's a product of what's happening, this waking up, this, this thing that's happening. It's happening because we're all kind of feeling it and, and doing it, and it's resonating through our frequencies of being. And uh, we're seeing big changes, but at the same time, we have, in my opinion, I, I have to be careful with what I say to people. I have to, I have to be careful with those novice people, the junior people that don't have those building blocks, uh, because I'm so far advanced when it comes to understanding false flag operations, how the government works, my relationship with the state, history, how history is full of lies, that some people just are not there, and that me just talking about, for example, food security is where they're at. And if I can bring my level down to their level, it's like getting on your knees and talking to a six-year-old and looking at them eye to eye and speaking them in the language that they speak. You can actually connect with them a lot better than if you try and look down at them and say, why don't you know this? Why aren't you doing it? I gave you a link. Why aren't you watching it? Don't you know it's uh, you know it's your enslavement, right? And I think that's where a lot of the conflict comes from, wasted energy as, as an activist. Well, that's typical persecutor base, where two people are on the persecutor base of the drama triangle trying to gain ground there and push the other one off. And that is going to drain you ultimately, and it's not you're not going to achieve anything by doing that. One of you is going to go, oh, I didn't win. I, I fell off the persecutor base. He threw me down to the victim base, and I don't want to be there. Yeah. So th- it's true that the novice, dealing with novices and knowing that they're novices and knowing that they have a penchant and preference for, I'd say that people are hobbits. People want to be like hobbits. They want to wiggle their hairy bare toes and drink some ale and have a good chat or a good time together, you know. Mm -hmm. And we, I wish we could have that all the time while we're here, but as you said earlier, this is a uh, three-dimensional earth plane as some kind of a school and we are here perhaps to wake up and to see how how we're being played and how we're being exploited and learning about it and learning about our own hidden power that we don't know how to use absolutely that's the purpose i think yeah and if we all did that there would be massive changes you know, and, uh, you know, looking at the American politics, what's going on right now between Trump and Sanders and the same repetitive thing over and over. You see how people are exporting their their powers and they're externalizing their powers, thinking that they need to be saved. And uh, that someone who's else is going to, you know, by changing the driver, you're actually going to change the, the concept of the vehicle itself. Right. 
And I, I just, I just firmly believe that, you know, focus on yourself, be in good health of who you are, and that not only physically, but in your mental health. Um, and, and what, what you, what revolves in your mind, in I, my, my belief does become your reality. And by having these balanced thoughts and open to what could be, um, allows the possibility to happen. And, and that's creating the future. And that's what we need to do. And that's what I do. And, uh, I, I find it, it really, really benefits me more to, to listen to someone and to hear what's going on in their lives than it is for me to educate them and tell them what's going on. So, and then, you know, I listen to your podcasts and I, I, I see what you've done, Sophia. It was about 10 years ago that I reached out to you because your, uh, 9 11 Mysteries was on Google Video before it emerged with YouTube. And, uh, you know, it just, it resonated with me. It was like, bingo, what the heck? Who is this lady? And I need to contact her. And look what it's turned into. And it's what we produce. It's what we bring to the table. It's what, it's the buffet, it's the, it's the product we bring to the buffet table that makes the buffet so great versus who's going to feed me and, and what's on the table, right? So that's the kind of philosophy I live by is show up. 99% of life is showing up. 1% is finishing. And if you can just show up and be of service, what that looks like, uh, there's, there's huge impacts on that versus what's in it for me and I'm not getting what I need. And, but there's a balance in that, though, right, in, in, in the totality. Well, of course. And, Paul, you are, you know, when I hear you talk, I just think, wow, this is how people should be. They should think as expansively as Paul. They should be like Paul's, different kinds of Paul's but that's what I like about you that's what I like talking about you. talking that's what I like about talking <laughs> to you I don't know how to talk anymore but I want people to hear this I want people to hear this is how someone who's 36 who woke to woke up to all this and he was 26 or younger well I wake up every this morning how- and that's that's another p- distinction I'll be really quick but that's another distinction I think about often it's like in the physical world, we wake up every day and we go back to sleep every night. And I thought about that. And, it's, and everybody says, oh, I woke up 10 years ago. What, you don't go back to sleep? You don't recharge? I do yoga. Yeah. And one of my, my yoga teacher always says, in order to find truth, you need to replace ignorance with ignorance. And I just, every time she said that, it was just, I'd grind my teeth and I'd be like, that's bullshit. you know. Like, but then I said, well, try it on, Paul, as if it's a jacket. Try it on. Maybe it won't, doesn't fit. Maybe it does fit. Maybe it doesn't fit, but it looks good. Maybe it fits, but it doesn't look good. I don't know. It's, but, but be open to trying it on. And now that I hear people saying waking up, it's like, you know what? There might be something to going back to bed in order to wake up fresh. And the problem with a lot of people is that they woke up 10 years ago and they've never gone back to bed. So there could be that. <laughs> I don't know where I'm going with that, but I've, I've thought about that recently. And it's like there could be some truth involved with kind of going back to bed and waking up and going back to bed and waking up. And there's that whole concept of death and the resurrection that spirituality and biblical stuff talks about, whether or not it's true or not, right? The fall of the sun and the rise of the spring and the fall of the sun and the rise of the spring. And each day we go to bed, it's important to go to sleep. And uh, I was asleep for many, many, many years. And so now I don't condemn people who are quote unquote asleep. I realize that by waking them up and flashing the lights on and off, proverbial speaking, is going to make them hate me because I hate it when people wake me up. But if you cook some bacon, I know a lot of people don't eat bacon. I still like bacon. But if you cook some bacon or you cup a cu- cook a cup of coffee, put some coffee on and people wake up to the smell, then there's a much better approach to the communications and talking to them than by flashing the lights on or taking their blankets off or splashing water on their face. And so I kind of have this reservation for waking people up now and i say you know wake up when you want to wake up because you know i i don't i don't feel it's so urgent anymore um and i feel there's there's time we do have time and uh if you just provide that time for people people will wake up on their own let nature do its thing and i think that's what we're seeing but it's our expectations of having it done today and having this utopian everybody's awake and all the bad guys are dead is 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 not helping our, not helping us, because in the long run, I believe in justice for all. Even those who have done evil stuff, they should get a fair trial. They should be heard in a fair court, and they, sh- and that's what I project. That's the world I want to see. So why would I want to, you know, hang all of the people that did nine? Like, I get it, but 
that's not that's just replacing one murderer with the next, and that's not what I want to do. I want to create a world of love and passion and and understanding and truth and justice and you know just kind of uh, understanding. And I think by uh, living that, I do explore. I do explore that. And in in the circles of people that I touch on a daily basis, that's all that matters. I don't affect people in Minnesota, in Florida. I may I may have an effect on them when they watch the YouTube video, but at the end of the day, it's the people within your immediate circles that matter the most. Your legacy. I've learned this. My legacy is not what I want. It's what people create for me of what people perceive of me. That's my that's the legacy of Paul Stone, and that's the legacy of Sophia Smallstorm. So it's the people that are in your immediate proximity that matter most. So what impact are you having on them on a daily basis? And, you know, if we can leave it on that, then if we all did that, man, it would be a powerful world, right? Right. Um, my vision is to have all the victims rush up to the persecutor base and push all the persecutors <laughs> off the base and then stand there and scream for rescuers. <laughs> That'd be nice. Yeah. But then you wouldn't have that balanced yeah. triangle anymore, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, the persecutors would be gone. The victims would say, we got rid of them. Now come and save us. Yeah, well, you look at so. nature again, like there's a place for lions, you know? There is. There's a place for. Uh, I live up here. There's cougars. There's bears where I live. And uh, you know, if we if we killed all the cougars and bears, we would, uh, in my opinion, we would change the ecosystem. You'd change a lot. So I think there's knowing that they exist, but also having the knowledge of how to prevent yourself from, you know, being attacked by them. And that's that's the intelligent part that we need to do. When you see a hurricane coming or a tornado coming, you're intelligent. Well, you need to do what you need to do to protect yourself and your family. And you know, you by you trying to save the world could actually jeopardize your own being, and you're missing the point. So I think uh, there's there's a ba- I, I agree with you. Like I'd love to get those pushing the persecutors off, and there, I, I there's a big uh, there's a lot of emotion, there's a lot of energy behind that that a lot of us activists have because we're all about truth and justice. But at the same time, when you look at the big picture, uh, I think the balance of the world exists. And when you look at nature, and if you follow nature, then you understand that. There's a place for lions. There's a place for those persecutors. Look, the lions are the apex predators. And I am um, watching Kevin Richardson stuff. This I'm going to put this on my blog because I'm just so awed by it. This is a guy who is an am- animal behaviorist. He's South African. And uh, they prepared a, an area on the savanna, I guess, of South Africa um, for some animals to be who are going to be filmed in a movie called The White Lion. And it's a 700-acre park called The Kingdom, but it's very wild. And there are hyenas and giraffes and lions. And Richardson uh, was, I guess, featured in the film. I think he was one of the directors of the film. And after the film, they've kept the park going, and they've got all these lion prides in it. And Richardson is one of those few human beings. You've seen him on YouTube. He kisses the lion on the nose. And he can go and wrestle with lions. He, mm-hmm. he goes to a grove of whatever the trees, kinds of trees, I don't know. And he calls their name. They come bounding out. And he goes, where have you been? They hug them and they, yeah, to? unreal. Yeah. And I cannot believe this. He sits there. He leans back against a couple of lions and... uh they're all cool, and they lick him, and um, w- whenever he wears a fluffy top, as he calls it, they chew it to bits because that's his skin. They know not to touch his human skin and pierce that, but they'll pierce his fluffy top because that's what they do to one another. They chew on each other's skin. It's all lion affection. And I'm thinking, wow, this is amazing. This guy could just lean and relax against a couple of lions, and it's... They love him, and he loves them, and is this infinite love? And, um, you know, so that got me thinking on what is infinite love, because I'm watching something that I have not really ever seen before, and this is pretty amazing, and he just learned how to be this way through following his own instincts and going against what the uh, education is when you're an animal trainer or keeper or behaviorist. It's just amazing to watch. It gives you this 
feeling of like breathtaking um, inspiration, I guess. And you think, look at what this world is really about. It's really about this thing that David Icke talks about, infinite love. And here it is on a on in Africa amongst species who should be one of us should be very terrified of the other. And yet this guy's not. And these lions, I would say, are semi-wild. I don't know if that's an educated or uneducated pronouncement. But I have been watching these things lately and thinking, how do I explain this? How can I become more like this? You know, the world isn't just about getting in my car and driving somewhere and coming home and paying a bill. It's not just about commerce. And the lions and Kevin are not relating through commerce, although commerce affects their existence. Because the reality is this park has been going for 12 years, and uh, it costs fifteen to 20000 a month wow. to keep it going. And he is now being supported. The l- last video I looked at said that he's being supported by an, uh, you know, a, an anonymous to us, a uh, benefactor who's got the wealth to keep it going, but ultimately they want to commercialize it a little more to get groups in there to see and watch and learn more about uh, this the wildlife in Africa um, so as to protect and conserve um, all these species that are being wiped out because of beliefs. There we go again with our, that 1% that if you eat a soup made out of tiger bone or tiger bone meal or lion bone meal or rhino horn, you're going to be uh, a very amazing power will be conferred on you. This is very much like the shark fin soup. Um, And, you know, there are apparently people all over the world who have these and cultivate these beliefs that eating a bowl of shark fin soup makes you something strong like the shark. (laughs) And you're laughing, but they would take this very, very seriously. One of the things I read on Richardson's website is that, you know, rhino horn is keratin. That's all it is. It's like eating your own fingernails. That's all it is. It's just... I'm laughing at myself more than anything because I was there. I was at that position where I had a belief system at one point where I did things based on a belief system. And... uh, it's I, I laugh not as a not as a looking down, but more of like, wow, have I progressed? And that's yeah. that's that's it, right? And yeah, and these customs, you know, on our planet are just changing it. Once refrigeration came to ships, they could then take these fins and and put them in freezers and they throw the sharks back. It's terrible. Yeah, it's very I've seen awful. That. Horrible. It's yeah. And the same with capturing rhinos and lions. Every everything is moving toward extinction and what's going to happen is that these biotech companies are going to give us GMO wildlife, they'll call it wildlife, because once it was wild, and we'll have, you know, wildlife refuges where some of these species will be put there to decorate the land and to represent what has disappeared. But thanks to science, it hasn't quite disappeared. Now we can make a baby lion in a lab. And we'll always have lions to look at because these are the ones we've engineered who can survive. And if they don't, we can always replace them because we have ways to put them back there (laughs) on the landscape that, you know, they... And their slogan will be, extinction is now extinct. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. And that's why I think so little is being done on an international level against poaching and against these belief systems. They're allowed to uh, flourish. Um, A problem, reaction, it, solution, right? Right. I mean, I don't know. I'm just guessing. I'm thinking. Well, you're looking that at they the patterns. Fl- you're looking at the patterns that exist. And what you're saying sounds like the pattern. It looks like the pattern. And, it's, and it seems like you come in as the hero, right? 
save humanity from all those bad evil guys, even though that was you that was killing them to create the problem. So, interesting. Well, we are living in a wondrous place. There are wondrous things that we can do and look at and learn from and be more like and we have to plumb ourselves for that dormant wondrousness because we all have wondrousness, you know, and that's what will change the world when we start using, bringing up, dredging up more of that and saying, look, and in that is my purpose or your purpose or his or her purpose. It's in that dormant self that, is the ninety is in the ninety eight percent? Yeah, and, and practice talking about what you want versus what you don't want. I think that's a for me when I realized that and started changing the language because language we won't get into it now, but language is is the spell that is put upon us. And it's in our legal system, and uh, you know your thoughts convert into language. Thoughts sight comes before words, and uh, if you can learn how to talk about what you want versus what you don't want, which is what I believe a lot of the alternative ma- media, conspiracy theory media, actually promotes is what we don't want. And as long as we're fighting what we don't want, we're not spending time creating what we want. And that's a s- deep level psychological tool or ter- um, a weapon that is used against our own minds. And if you can, it's hard to, but if you can just, Create what you want and talk about and think about what you want. Like David Icke says, eternal love and you know creating love if within your relationships, then you will create it and it will become powerful and it will make a difference in most people's lives. I, I believe it because it's it's my experience of that. Well, thank you, Paul, for all these inspirations for your very um, sage-like take on so many things and we have covered ground in this discussion that I think is fascinating I hope people will get something from it and I'm so glad that I met you because I every time I talk to you I go wow there it is again that magical thing because you have it you have a magical thing operating in you in that connection between brain body brain mind person being self, um, soul, and heart. We'll throw heart in there, and then spirit. It's all in there. So we just heard it. We just heard the the gestalt wholeness of Paul, little Paul Stein. <laughs> yeah, Paul means small, so they say. Does it? So they say, but in my opinion, Paul means big, so whatever. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Yeah. Lovely chat. Yeah, thanks, Sophia. And I look forward to um, working with you in the future and uh, your future podcasts and all your growth and expansion as well. And I appreciate it. I acknowledge you for your work, as I have done in the past. And uh, send lots of love and power your way. And I look forward to uh, chatting with you again. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Sophia. Hi, this is Sophia letting you know about my store, avatarproducts.com. It began as a DVD store in the old days, but I've switched it over to products that I've found. Some of them I've actually thought of myself, and people have formulated them for me, biochemists with labs. And I am selling now a lot of body remediation items that you might enjoy as you discover your own body getting a little older, a accumulating a few more toxic materials and compounds. Our cells get challenged later in life. They need a little help doing their housekeeping. So avatarproducts.com, if you look under the health tab, the body and posture tab, there's a sun and skin tab, you'll find things like a fantastic argan oil soap, argan oil itself, magnesium products that are delivered through the skin, and iodine, seat cushions that keep you straight at your desk when you're constantly looking at your computer for more and more alternative information. Anyway, avatarproducts.com. Please go there. Please have a look. Definitely use the downloaded PDF form for sending in a check. Let's support each other and not enrich the banks. You can always mail your order in. 
And I thank you very much for your support.